Okay, so um, yeah, welcome to the second lecture. Now, what uh, I'm going to discuss is the following. We had uh, discussed uh, the outline on uh, Tuesday. So um, it was, I want to discuss baryogenesis and inflation. And uh, we started with uh, electroweak baryogenesis. And in fact, uh, that took a little longer than I expected because we had all this discussion, I think, which was quite uh, useful, maybe on Svalhorn processes and what happened there, because that is really uh, important for uh, baryogenesis in many ways. And I think it is also sort of an interesting complement to what you learn about axions and instantons in QCD. So that's, I think, an important problem uh, in quantum field theory. And I try to discuss uh, some aspects of that. So today, we now come to the second part, which is leptogenesis. And then I will very briefly uh, discuss other models. There will be not much time uh, uh, for this. And then we start with inflation and uh, hopefully come to the middle of this, roughly. So this is the plan. Now, uh, <clears throat> I should say there are many models. There's a huge literature on baryogenesis. That was a point I tried to make last time. I mean, there is, uh, it's one number. And uh, I don't know, a few thousand papers, I guess. So uh, what does that mean? And now, then in such a lecture, how do you pick models? Now, uh, I think what is important, and let me just say it again, I think it is important that um, one does not just invent a theory to explain one number, because that is always possible. But rather, one should have something which is uh, well motivated for other reasons and which sort of gives you uh, the baryonic symmetry as, a, I would say, byproduct, which is not invented in order to explain this number. And the other thing which I think is important is in order to make progress, we really have to check things by experiments and to link it to uh, observables in the lab and to cosmological astrophysical observables. That is also important. And that's, uh, I think, why I uh, emphasized these two things. Electroweak barrier genesis uh, is closely related uh, to the Higgs sector. And I think there will be a very good chance uh, to really test it at uh, uh, the LHC. And hopefully, uh, within a few years, we will know much more about the topic what is true, what is not true, uh, just uh, as a consequence of the uh, LHC data. Now, leptogenesis or connections to neutrinos, which I think is also very interesting. There, uh, in fact, the success of leptogenesis during the more than a decade now uh, is due to the fact that, in fact, it fits very well together with neutrinos. So we'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about that. And OK, then we'll move on to inflation. Now, uh, again, let me start for leptogenesis with a few uh, key references and some reviews. There is uh, the thing was suggested uh, by Fukugita and Yanagida about, uh, well, almost uh, 30 years ago. So like uh, barrier, electroweak baryogenesis is in some sense, in principle, an old topic. It's a little bit younger because of the fact that during the first 10 years, almost nobody paid attention to that. It was a very sort of, it was pop, uh, topic was not very popular. And the main focus was on electroweak baryogenesis. So that, uh, and that then changed. I mean, when it became clear that the Higgs is heavier, the electroweak baryogenesis has more difficulty, so it changed to that. So that's the, f the first paper really on this topic. Then uh, I mention these for the following reasons. I say these key references is not necessarily always the most original or most important or best papers. Of course, there should be interesting papers, but are those which uh, sort of started some direction which uh, are important if you really want to get deeper into the subject. So then I think that's a good reference to do some reading and to move on from there. So Lazarides and Chafi, in fact, I think were the first who proposed uh, what goes under the name of uh, non-thermal leptogenesis. Now, what that is is the following. It's again related to heavy Majorana neutrinos. We will see a little bit how. Uh, however, the production is not thermal, 
as we do it with Saharov and uh, early universe thermodynamics, but uh, the production comes from decays, out of a, from decays of uh, um, fields, for in, in particular the inflaton field. Then there is a very special direction, which, uh, well, one can have different opinions on, but which goes under the name of resonant leptogenesis. And that uh, is something which you get uh, if you uh, have mass degeneracies uh, among the heavy neutrinos, as we will see. And that is a possibility then to lower the scale of B minus L breaking and uh, to uh, see maybe heavy neutrinos, heavy Majorana neutrinos, even at the LHC. And this group and a number of other people really pushed uh, this field over the years so that uh, a number of consequences were derived which can be checked. And uh, then uh, this work, in some sense, I would say, is a certain end of uh, this uh, simplest version of thermal electrogenesis, where you can see quantitatively how well it works, and various errors have been estimated, and uh, sort of a full calculation with all the ingredients which were needed was done. And then there are reviews. Uh, let me mention in particular the last two, because they cover material for which I will not have that much time in this lecture, namely the important uh, flavor effects which you have uh, in leptogenesis. So I come to that. So that's uh, all right. Now, as a motivation, let me start from uh, granulification. As you know, the standard model uh, is very well embedded in uh, to a granulified group, SO5 or SO10, and then that the sequence which continues to E6, the exceptional groups, E6, E7, E8. And I think that's a very promising and interesting route and has a high probability, in my opinion, of being correct. So the standard model particles, the left-handed quarks, um, the uh, up quarks, electron, down quarks, uh, lepton doublets, they fit into remarkably into SU5 representations. And then, in addition, you may have, or we will need, that's, a co that's the basis of these lectures, a right-handed neutrino. Actually, maybe it's interesting uh, to to remind you, well, you will not know because you are uh, too young for that, but for many years it was said that one of the successful prediction of SU5 unification was that neutrinos were massless. Because uh, you see what you always need, all this uh, objects of the standard model we know fit into these two representations and this is an additional state, singlet state, which we will need. If this is not there, and you just write down the Lagrangian, SU5 renormalizable Lagrangian, and work out the consequences, neutrinos are massless. However, if you extend the group, you will also get these guys, the right-handed neutrinos, which are uh, important. Now, uh, you can then write down uh, your cover couplings uh, for these objects, which uh, are, if you take an SU5 in very notation, I just sketch it here. You couple two of those objects to one Higgs, you couple such an object and this object uh, to another Higgs. You couple this and the singlet to this. This is what, in the end, will generate a neutrino masses. And then you can have, in addition, something which does not involve the Higgs and which is just a mass term in SU5, just a mass term for uh, the right hand neutrinos. And that is, in fact, very important because uh, you can see already here the expectation values of these Higgs fields uh, are given by the electroweak scale. So that will generate mass terms of the order, say, of 100 GeV times some Yukawa coupling. But this is independent of that and can generically be much bigger. So this is the starting point and uh, was, in fact, I think, uh, some of the basis also for uh, the discovery uh, of leptogenesis, namely the realization that if uh, the fact that the neutrino masses are so small, if that is due to the existence of right-handed neutrinos, then these right-handed neutrinos can also cosmologically do very interesting things. In particular, they can decay and they can generate a baryon asymmetry. I mean, if you have such a mass here for right-handed neutrinos, which is much, much bigger than the mass you generate by electroweak symmetry breaking, which would be something like this, Yukawa coupling times uh, the wave of the Fermi scale, then uh, you get a mass matrix, say uh, a six uh, by six mass matrix, which for the neutrinos, which essentially looks like this. You have a zero entry here, you have here, 
uh, MD, you have here MD, you have here this big uh, thing. M, all of them being uh, three by three matri uh, mass matrices, and if you diagonalize that, you find typically uh, eigenvalues, say M, this is just written without indices now, so in the simplest case of just a two by two matrix, and you find other eigenvalues which are M squared uh, over M, which uh, would be, say, uh, would give you the mass matrix for light neutrinos. Capital M being big gives you that this is small, and this is uh, this famous uh, seesaw mechanism, which I guess was discussed in detail with uh, some of its applications in the lectures by Smirnov. Now, uh, so you get then, uh, if you, and if you do that, you get another thing which is important. That is the following. You see, here you have one lepton and you have one anti-lepton, a left-handed neutrino, a right-handed anti-neutrino. And uh, here you have two neutrinos. So that means such a mass term violates lepton number. And that is very important. It violates lepton number, so this is a Majorana mass term. And uh, therefore, if you diagonalize uh, the whole mass matrix, you will get, although this is a Dirac mass matrix, you will get all together as mass eigenstates uh, six um, Majorana neutrinos. Now, these uh, six Majorana neutrinos, three of them being heavy and three of them being light, uh, is what we have. And the ones which are light, uh, they uh, do the usual physics with neutrino oscillations or, uh, and so on, which uh, Alexei uh, Smirnov discussed. Now, let's do a very naive uh, estimate. So uh, if you take, uh, say, say, this, this uh, seesaw formula, which I wrote here on the board again, and you insert, uh, say, for this mass, this Dirac mass, say, 100 GeV, and uh, for this, a big mass, and you take that big mass uh, equal to the grand unification mass, then uh, you get uh, a mass here, which is about 0.01 electron volt. And this, uh, I think, is very remarkable. It tells you if you take the two scales for which we have evidence from the standard model, one scale which corresponds to electric symmetry breaking, and another scale for which we have evidence from the unification of gauge couplings, and you take this ratio, you really get something which is in the range where the neutrino masses are. So far, we know two mass differences. So the square root of the mass difference which you see in atmospheric neutrino oscillation and in solar neutrino oscillations, one is 0.05 EV, the other is 0.009 EV. So you see that with this estimate, uh, you are really hitting the right order of magnitude. Now, uh, this is, of course, not a proof. It's just uh, an argument. However, it is, I think, very suggestive. You can have different situations where you avoid this. That happens in resonant leptogenesis, which I will discuss also. Now, uh, to continue, then, you have to calculate uh, the um, CP violation, which you have in the case of, say, the lightest of uh, these heavy neutrinos. We will assume, following the typical mass patterns which we see in the standard model, that also these right-handed neutrinos are hierarchical. That's not necessary, but I think it's a simple starting point. And then what is important for leptogenesis will be just the lightest, and one denoted here the lightest, of these uh, heavy Majorana neutrinos. And then uh, the CP asymmetry is the difference of these decay rates inter lepton and anti lepton divided by the sum. And for that, you can derive a nice formula where the CP asymmetry is just given in terms of neutrino masses. These are the matrix of Yukawa couplings here. This is the light neutrino mass matrix. And here you have the mass of the lightest uh, of uh, the heavy neutrinos. In fact, uh, that what is very important and causes a couple of, uh, there are a couple of delicate questions associated with that, is that this formula comes about through the interference of the three level term and two uh, quantum corrections, a vertex corrections and a self energy correction. And in fact, uh, this complete, uh, the, the correct result was first obtained here at uh, CISA, in fact, I think uh, many years ago. 
by Covirole and uh, Visani at the time and was an important result. Now, let's now, before we go into the details, uh, again, as we try to do it for electroweak baryogenesis, make an estimate of what kind of um, asymmetry uh, we can expect, baryon asymmetry. So what will happen is uh, the following. You will have, uh, say, decay. I start from this heavy neutrino N. Then I have here some blob, which involves uh, the tree level and the quantum corrections. And I go, say, to lepton uh, and Higgs. And uh, that will generate uh, a difference in B, well, in lepton number, but also in B minus L. So this is the quantity which we discussed on Tuesday. You generate, uh, in the case of these objects, you generate an asymmetry in B minus L. And once you have that, that is not affected by Svalaron uh, processes. It just is what it is. So you generate that uh, early. And then this is, uh, uh, gives you then B and L according to the formulae which, you, which I've given you uh, on Tuesday. So given this asymmetry B minus L, you get B and L. And it's related uh, by a Svalaron factor. And this is something which you see here. This is a CP asymmetry which you have in the end for the baryon asymmetry. And this is, well, we come to that later. Now, uh, so the, if you want in the end to calculate the baryon asymmetry, the question is how big is the CP asymmetry? If you start from this hierarchical picture and you insert in this formula for the CP asymmetry, which you showed you, most naively just uh, the um, uh, largest eigenvalue for the large neutrino mass matrix and uh, for the light neutrino mass matrix, and you take the mass of the lightest of the heavy ones, and this is the expectation value of the Higgs boson, then this is the loop factor, roughly. In fact, this is uh, close to also uh, an upper bound on the CP asymmetry, which was derived by, uh, by Davidson and Ibarra. Then you get for this, you get something like uh, value of 0.1 from this. And then you can use, again, the seesaw formula and replace V squared over M3 by 1 over big M3. So you get a CP asymmetry, which is a loop factor times the hierarchy of the heavy Majorana neutrinos. Now, if this hierarchy is of the hierarchies which we see in quark and lepton mass matrices in the standard model, you may say it's, you will conclude if that's a model dependent statement, then you will get something between 10 to the minus uh, five, 4 to 10 to the minus 5. So CP asymmetry 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 6. And uh, that you will have here. Then you have the Svalaron factor. And then you have to account for the fact that the uh, asymmetry in B uh, will not change. But if you calculate the ratio, this quantity A to B, which is the asymmetry divided by the photon density, the photon number will change. Because in the beginning, when you generate this uh, uh, lepton or B minus L asymmetry, in the beginning, uh, you have uh, all the quantities of the standard model sort of in equal number because you have very high temperature. And then as you go to lower temperatures, in particular below the electroweak phase transition and the QCD phase transition, all this stuff annihilates away and essentially goes into photons. So the photon number density gets uh, enhanced by a big factor uh, compared to the original uh, heavy neutrino. Uh, number density, which is almost a factor of 100 here. And then there is something which I will now talk a little bit about, um, which you get, uh, for, for that you have to solve so-called Boltzmann equations. And uh, putting those factors together, you get an asymmetry, indeed, of the right order of magnitude. Now, uh, I think what just, I spent a little bit of time on that just to illustrate that you can sort of naively, if you start from a gut picture, understand where the asymmetry comes from. And uh, the biggest factors which move you to this very small number here come really from neutrino physics. It's uh, and the structure of the gut, gut mass matrices. That's what gives you this factor. In the end, all the thermodynamics here 
This factor is trivial. The thermodynamics is in this. And that's a factor which varies if you do the calculation. I will show you between, say, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. So there's a relatively small uncertainty. So uh, this is a, one big difference compared to electroweak barrier genesis. And uh, uh, the other is that here, whereas in electroweak barrier genesis, um, barrier number is always um, conserved during the process, and it's just the dynamics of the bubble wall which makes the transition. Here in leptogenesis, you really have intrinsically lepto number violation, and uh, that leads that you see in the decays of the heavy Majorana neutrinos. Yeah? Uh, which, which masses, M1 and M3? Yeah. No. Typically, you know, these are uh, the uh, masses of the heavy neutrinos, N1 and N3. Now, if you, so of the first and the third family, you, have, you will have three right-handed neutrinos if you have three. Uh, this is just the mass ratio. The mass is individually. So typically, in these models, what you get is that M3 is about, uh, say, a lambda gut, which you might take to be, uh, say, 10 to the 15 GeV, or 10 to the 16, something from a unification. And then you, you go down uh, to M2, which is smaller, and then finally to M1. And if this is about 10 to the minus 5 M3, you end up at a mass of about 10 to the 10 GeV. This is a picture. So if you take, say, the top mass to the up quark mass, it's a factor 10 to the 5. No, 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 no. The, the mass ratios uh, is the unification you have in the coupling constants, in the gauge coupling constant, not in these Yukawa matrices. Well, there are some models where you can also study Yukawa coupling unification, but this is not what is relevant here. So it's really the, yeah, it's this. So that's how you come uh, to these numbers. Sorry. Yeah? Uh, if you take a mobile variation, this is leptogenesis, yeah. you will get much less symmetry, right? Uh, well, uh, of course, if there would be a strong, if you generate all the baryonis, well, th that's an <laughs> important question. Uh, in principle, of course, you can have uh, a number of sources for baryonis symmetry. And if uh, you have now a strong electroweak phase transition, of course, which generates a big asymmetry, then that's what matters in the end. Uh, however, if, as we saw, it's difficult, so suppose there is small or no asymmetry variation, um, a generation at the electroweak phase transition, then you can do it by something like this. And what is special about this mechanism is, we'll discuss it a little bit, uh, that uh, these right-handed neutrinos, if they are in thermal equilibrium in the very early universe, also can wash out uh, 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 an asymmetry which was generated uh, in, another, in other ways. So they, uh, these right-handed neutrinos essentially act a little bit like a vacuum cleaner. You know, they first uh, erase the baryon asymmetry. They are so-called, uh, that's because they violate lepton number. And by the Sphaleron, together with the Sphaleron processes, uh, they, that can, uh, if you have the chemical potential for the leptons being zero, that wipes out everything. And then uh, in their decays, you then generate uh, the lepton asymmetry. Now, uh, <clears throat> anyway, so this would be one explanation. Now you have to do also the thermodynamics. And uh, for that, you have to consider the process in the plasma. This is the simplest. Uh, these are the simplest graph. And uh, just the decays of the heavy neutrino into lepton Higgs. And then you have here uh, lepton number violating processes. And uh, here also, and scatterings with the top and so on. I, I should say, uh, in fact, the first person who analyzed that uh, with Boltzmann equations in more depth was, in fact, Markus Lutti, who is now here talking about supersymmetry. But uh, he did uh, early and 
very interesting work uh, on this. Now, then, over many years, uh, groups worked on that, and there, is, there are some definite results in the simplest case where you sum uh, over the lepton flavors in the final state. I should say, in principle, you can have, in these decays, you can have an index, say, alpha here, alpha being one to three for the neutrinos, and you can also have a flavor dependence here. You can go to one, two, three, to leptons of the first, second, or third family. And um, what is done if you, uh, here is you talk first about uh, the total baryon asymmetry which you generate and lepton asymmetry, and then you sum over these lepton flavors in the final state. Then that gives you a considerable simplification, which is in the end not quite justified for thermodynamic reasons, but it gives you the first uh, and uh, simple uh, results. You can then uh, describe thermodynamically the system by uh, a number density of this right handed neutrinos, which has a term here. This is a Boltzmann equation. I should say this variable z, you will see it also on the next uh, slide, uh, is sort of uh, a good variable to replace time in this process. So it's the mass of the lightest of the heavy neutrinos divided by temperature. So as temperature decreases, Z increases, and there is a factor by means of which you can relate that to time. So decreasing temperature goes to increasing Z. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, well, it's, uh, we are, phi is a total Higgs doublet. I mean, because we are in high scale above electroweak phase transition now, and therefore you have to consider just the uh, uh, Higgs doublet as a massless uh, scalar doublet. Now, uh, so you have uh, two Boltzmann equations, one for the number density of these heavy neutrinos, one for B minus L. And uh, you see this, both here have a factor uh, which is the number density minus an equilibrium number density. So you see that once, you, once they are in equilibrium, the number is just constant. And once you are in equilibrium, then this is also constant. And all that happens that is by washout terms, uh, an existing B minus L asymmetry is erased. This is what you get from this term. However, if you get a departure from thermal equilibrium here, that means this term is different from zero, then this becomes a source term in here, and by a proportional to epsilon, it generates an asymmetry. This is the usual out of equilibrium decay scenario here um, uh, combined with uh, washout. And that can be uh, worked out in uh, glory detail and uh, you then have to discuss all the decay rates. I will compare it with the Hubble parameter, as you learned that in the lectures by Subir Sarkar. I will show that on the next slide. And particularly interesting, a useful quantity in this discussion is an effective neutrino mass defined like this, which, uh, which is uh, almost like the CISO formula, just different contraction of indices. And that has to be larger than a so-called equilibrium mass, which is about 10 to the minus 3 electron volts, which is a statement that the decay uh, of the, uh, the, the, the width of the decaying neutrino, uh, gamma, is larger than the Hubble parameter. That gives you that this m tilde is larger m star. So this is nothing but that. But it's useful uh, to formulate it in terms of these neutrino masses in order to compare it uh, in, then with uh, neutrino physics. And what you then get is an interesting picture. You know, I showed you that the total baryon asymmetry was proportional to this one factor, so-called efficiency factor. And uh, this is determined by thermodynamics. In order to get that, you have to solve these Boltzmann equations and calculate it. And, uh, you then find that uh, this uh, has, if you go below this mass of uh, 10 to the minus 3 electron volts, this efficiency factor has a rather big uncertainty. 
by uh, many orders of magnitude which depend on the initial state you have. So for instance, it depends on whether you start with an equilibrium number density for the right in neutrinos, or whether you start with zero and generate the heavy neutrinos from the bath. It depends on what kind of scattering processes you have, and so on. If you make uh, this mass a little bigger, that means you go to this so-called strong washout regime. Then you see that all these lines more or less merge in this, and you get a firm prediction uh, for the baryon asymmetry given this particular neutrino mass. So in this sense, the thermodynamics for this process becomes simple. And therefore, that makes leptogenesis a very sort of robust uh, thing. It's really uh, uh, rather well determined, the baryon asymmetry which you calculate here in terms of uh, neutrino properties. Here I show you uh, a comparison of the various rates with uh, the Hubble parameter. The Hubble parameter here is, goes like this. And here you see a washout rate. And uh, the baryon asymmetry gets somehow, if you work it out, fixed around here. when the washout becomes unimportant and the decay becomes uh, important. And you can then generate uh, pictures like this, where uh, you start either from an equilibrium number density or you generate a heavy neutrino abundance. and uh, then at some point they decay, and uh, you generate uh, an asymmetry, which is essentially a function of uh, the light neutrino masses. So the picture which you get is, in some sense, very simple. You have a, a, big, a big thermal bath, which are all the standard mole particles. And in this bath, you have, and they have gauge interactions. That is important. Therefore, you have a good equilibrium, a good thermal equilibrium for those. Then you have this heavy neutrino, which is coupled only by small uh, Yukawa interactions. And uh, therefore, it's coupled very weakly. So this is like uh, somebody who walks through this plasma uh, a little bit randomly, very weakly coupled. And the small CP violations of this object, then uh, the decays and also inverse scatterings uh, and so on, and then give you, if you work, solve these Boltzmann equations, can give you the symmetry. And that uh, you can then use uh, this whole uh, to derive constraints also on neutrino masses to see where this thing is consistent. You get from these washout processes, you get an upper bound of about 0.1 electron volt for neutrinos, a lower bound for this heavy neutrino mass. This is indicated here. And you get altogether a window in which uh, of neutrino masses, which is sort of preferred by leptogenesis, where these masses are between 10 to the minus 3 and 0.1 electron volt. I should say that this was all derived under the assumptions uh, that you can sum over the lepton flavors in the final state. That makes the thing easier, and uh, then you can get these results almost analytically. Whereas if you include the flavor dependence, the story becomes more complicated and is difficult to um, quote exact bounds. In this report by um, Davidson and Nier, uh, it's uh, Nardi and Nier, they conclude that these bounds are sort of relaxed by about an order of magnitude. But that's a difficult story. Anyway, I just want to uh, emphasize the importance of this uh, flavor effects, but the details are complicated. So that is a naive picture. Now. Uh, sometimes called vanilla leptogenesis, because it, it just works or it and fits. Actually, I should say the following. Um, as I said, the original idea of Fukukita and Nagida wasn't really pursued for a long time, because people were interested in leptogenesis. Then, when leptogenesis looked a little more difficult, people started to look at this. And then neutrino oscillations were discovered. And the fact that what you get from neutrino oscillations fits well together with this, that gave a boost uh, to this picture of leptogenesis. And I should say this is non-trivial. Because uh, here, I showed you, you get roughly this upper bound of about 0.1 electron volt. Uh, at the time when much of this work was done, it was still discussed whether you could have Majorana neutrinos, say, of a few electron volts. If that would be true, this whole thing would be in very bad shape essentially excluded. So the fact that the neutrino, so the neutrino plays somehow in this business, the absolute neutrino mass scale. 
not the mass differences, but the absolute neutrino masses, because they violate Lepton number, they play about the role which the Higgs mass plays in electroweak biogenesis. So it just seemed to be the case that because uh, they are, uh, the neutrinos are so light, it just, just fits very well together. Actually, I should say one thing. Uh, if, you, if you work in this stuff, and you see how the various rates which contribute, the Boltzmann equations which contribute uh, to this process. You have these washout processes, decays, inverse decays, scattering with the top, Higgs processes, you have scattering with gauge bosons, and so on. At some point, you start to wonder why it works at all. Because uh, on the one hand, you need lepton number violation in order uh, in, to produce in the beginning an asymmetry in B minus L. On the other hand, if you have too much lepton number violation, whatever you generate will be washed out. And that is controlled by the size of the neutrino masses. So this only works because you have lepton number violation, but not, so, not too much. And you have it in such a way that all uh, the rates which you can calculate here in the end conspire to give you altogether a nice picture. So this is a little bit miraculous. Uh, the a priori, there's no reason for that to work. Like for electroweak baryogenesis, if the Higgs mass would have been, say, 30 GeV, then um, it would be perfect with electroweak baryogenesis. Nevertheless, uh, we, at the moment, we know just mass differences uh, between the light neutrinos. We do not know really whether these exist, and if they exist, how heavy they are. Within this gut picture, which I described, uh, you have an idea of where the masses are. Uh, however, uh, we don't know whether that is true. And it could be that these masses are, in fact, still at the TV range. This is uh, something, as I said, which has been pursued over the years by Pilafsis uh, and friends. And this is uh, something which I. Uh, some formula which I, in fact, copied from one of their papers. So suppose now these neutrinos become close to each other in mass. Then uh, you have uh, the, these neutrinos. Then uh, you cannot just take the lightest of them. You have to take all of them into account. So you have to take the effect of the three families here. You have to take the effect of the three families here. And then you get CP isometries, which are, in fact, matrices in uh, these two indices. And if you work out these uh, CP asymmetries, then you find that they go, uh, that they depend on the difference of these masses. So making this difference small, and here are the decay widths of those objects, so making these masses small uh, enhances the CP asymmetry. How that works exactly is still debated. It's, uh, this is very recent work here. I mean, the, it's complicated, and people are working on that, but uh, formulae are, will be roughly of this type. And this is, in fact, something which you then can calculate based in such a model. And I just show you one explicit example. This is, again, this time variable z equals mass over temperature. And here you see uh, the baryon asymmetry, the lepton asymmetry here first. First very big, then, and then it converges here to, uh, say, this value. So you can have, I mean, these explicit calculations show that you can have a baryon generate lepton asymmetry in these models. However, at the price of uh, really uh, tuning uh, the mass differences rather accurately. And you need a very tiny mass difference compared to the sum of the masses. And in this table, these authors list that. For instance, you um, take here one of the mass differences is uh, this here, which is uh, about 10 to the minus 9. So delta m over m, I think I cannot read it here now, for I think m2 and m3, two of the masses, it's 10 to the minus 9. So you can say, well, that's an enormous fine tuning. And, uh, or you have to construct a model where you can really understand that, how, how you get such, uh, from a more fundamental theory, how you can get such a pattern of neutrino masses. So this is somehow 
uh, I think the question which you have to ask, uh, how natural uh, these mass matrices are. But there are some people who construct some flavor models where due to some symmetries, maybe you can have that. If you, yeah. So, so CP, the CP violation is in the phases of the neutrino mass matrix. Right, but the when they are degenerate? No, 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 no. No, they are, of course, not completely degenerate, but they are very close in mass. So it's a, uh, this game takes place when the mass difference is of the order of the widths, the decay widths. Okay, and then the CP violation is there. No, of course, that was taken. That, that is all done correctly, I think. Now, uh, if you have such a scenario, then you have some nice predictions for LHC. And I think it's very good to work, to push these models to the point where you see that. And that has been done here. For instance, imagine you have these neutrinos now with masses, they have neutrinos with masses of a few hundred GeV, and you have additional gauge bosons, W, charge W bosons, and a Z prime, which is frequently discussed, LHC physics then you can, say, pair produce uh, such heavy neutrinos, which then decay. Now, if you have uh, such vertices here, you get, via quantum corrections, all kinds of processes where you have to be careful. For instance, you get a, a process mu to E gamma, and in order uh, to be consistent with that, uh, the coupling which you have at this vertex has to satisfy an upper bound. And... Uh, then you have your model has to give uh, has to be consistent with uh, the neutrino masses, which you see. So, for instance, from the solar uh, thing, you get a band where this coupling should be here around 10 to the minus six. So you get a very small coupling. But then, what is interesting, once this is small, then uh, the width of these ends is long. They live long. So when you uh, produce them at the LHC, they will decay, uh, they have a finite uh, decay length, a macroscopic decay length. So displaced vertices, which is one of the things people are looking for at the LHC. And the decay length, which you may have, can range from a millimeter here to a meter. So that's in principle quite an interesting signature. If you want to have something which is consistent from the point of view of baryogenesis and with all the constraints from electroweak processes, uh, processes, flavor chain, lepton flavor violation, then uh, you are led uh, to really specific uh, predictions for the LHC, in this case, these uh, displaced vertices. So these authors recently had a long discussion of the LHC phenomenology of that. Now, um, <clears throat> let me mention one thing. Uh, leptogenesis, as I try to explain, is in principle a simple uh, picture. And um, it is uh, because the thermodynamics is simple, it is close to equilibrium, uh, you may think that it may be possible to make it a real theory. A real theory, because after all it's a quantum field theory, so one would think given the quantum field theory with certain parameters in the Lagrangian and say the standard cosmology, I should be able uh, to compute the baryon asymmetry which I produce with an arrow bar. Like a QCD calculation where you say the production cross-section of this or that is this number up to, say, 20% error. Now, uh, that, is, that requires that you do not just Boltzmann equations here for leptogenesis, uh, but that you really solve the full non-equilibrium problem uh, in quantum field theory. That's, uh, in principle, an interesting problem close to activities done in condensed matter. And um, so people, some, a couple of years ago, some activities on that started, and that's ongoing work. And uh, what you have to do, but it's making, has been making significant progress. And the reason that you can have some hope here is the following. These heavy neutrinos, it's just thermodynamically, it's just one degree in a big system. You have, say, roughly 100 uh, degrees of freedom for the standard model, and then, say, one additional uh, for the, uh, this heavy neutrino. So if this neutrino does a little bit, it doesn't change the thermodynamics of the system. So you can neglect the back reaction. 
that's a very important point, and that makes it significantly simpler than, for instance, non-equilibrium studies in heavy ion collisions. So uh, you can neglect that, and so you can then, and the other thing is the coupling, the Yukawa coupling, the coupling of these heavy neutrinos to the particles in the thermal bath are weak. So there you can do a perturbative expansion. It still remains complicated enough, but it's something which is doable. And uh, the formalism for that is developed. It's a schwinger keldish formalism. There you study generically Green's function on a complex contour, not just you have, instead of the usual schwinger dyson equation in field theory, you have something like a schwinger dyson equation on the contour. Instead of the usual Green function with Feynman boundary conditions, you have now two Green's functions, one the so-called um, spectral function, which contains information about the system, and another, which is a statistical propagator, which contains information about the initial conditions. That gives you a coupled system of equations, the so-called Kalan of Bame equations, which you can solve, in, well, systematically. It's not done fully yet, but in, uh, I would say, very good approximations, and there's really, you can see how this work uh, converges. And this is one example, which I, by Garni and company, what they calculated. And uh, they, in fact, made an application of this formalism to resonant leptogenesis. And you can compare uh, the enhancement, which you get, uh, say, in naive calculations, in resonant leptogenesis, with the one which you get from these kind of BAME equations. If you just use Boltzmann equations, you get something like this for the uh, maximum uh, CP. Essentially, R is defined to what the CP asymmetry is relative to a CP asymmetry. You get an enhancement here, which involves this difference. And by tuning parameters, this can become very big. Interestingly enough, if you do that due to various effects, it changes some. You get a plus here. So, of course, this is unphysical somehow that you have here, minus sign. And you can understand where it comes from. But doing the proper calculation with this formalism also fixes such problems. And you can get a reliable calculation and reliable results also for this um, resonant leptogenesis. So let me now summarize uh, leptogenesis. I think thermal leptogenesis is, say, simple in the sense that the basic picture is really very simple. You can, and that I think makes it su successful. You can uh, understand qualitatively the order of magnitude, and you can systematically improve on the quality of the calculations. So it's on the way, I think, to become a real uh, theory, and it fits very well together with what we know about neutrino masses. So we'll see. Therefore, what is very important uh, is uh, to determine the absolute neutrino mass scale in this business. So far, we know only mass differences, and uh, well, direct laboratory experiments have a rather weak uh, upper limit on uh, neutrino mass, which is, I think, around, what is it now? electron volt or something, and at Katrin, one is hoping for something like, uh, I think, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 electron volts. Cosmology may be able to do, not in a model independent way, but to do much better. And I think this, in this business, is very important. So uh, it would be very nice to get evidence, say, for a smallest neutrino mass of the order of 0 0.01 electron volt. That would be my favorite value. That would be right in this window, say, which you saw between 10 to the minus 3 and 0.1. And it would give you a sum of neutrino masses, say, of 0.07 electron volts, something like this. Of course, it would not pre prove uh, this picture of leptogenesis, but it would be, I think, a very strong further support. So, uh, and from various analysis, I think large-scale structure in particular, we can hope in the next, in the coming years, for maybe for a determination of the sum of the neutrino masses and therefore uh, the absolute neutrino mass scale. So that would be, I think, very important in that respect. This whole question of flavor effects remains important, and uh, further work needs to be done. 
in particular, there is a lot of work which went on, not in a model independent way, but within particularly theoretically motivated models like SO10 and so on, and I think that is very valuable. Resonant leptogenesis is a possibility and can be tested uh, at LHC, but of course the question is how do you understand uh, these masses uh, which you need in order to these rather degenerate heavy neutrino masses in order to make it work. I had no time to discuss non-thermal leptogenesis, but it's also a generic possibility and important. So this non-thermal is one where you generate the initial heavy neutrino abundance, not thermally, but say from inflaton decays or other heavy scalar particles. And uh, there's been significant progress now to the full QFT uh, treatment, so I think this uh, is on a good way. Other models. So I have only this page on other models. Of course, first of all, because the time is short. Also because I think that maybe in these cases uh, it's not so closely related to experiment. I mean, Affleck dying mechanism related to flat directions, in particular in the supersymmetric standard model, is a generically a very interesting possibility. So far we see no supersymmetry, and there are also a number of questions there. Uh, so uh, we will see what happens to that. What has also been discussed quite a bit in the literature is the decay of heavy moduli, which you get in string theory. It's also a possibility, but generically it involves a number of parameters. An interesting aspect of that is that you can relate it to dark matter. There's something called cold pariogenesis, which, hap which happens after the electric phase transition. You can have pariogenesis from, in connection with the strong CP problem with the QCD axion. There's a recent paper on that by Servant. You can have baryogenesis just from Hawking radiation. I just saw the title of the paper. I did not have time yet to read that. Maybe interesting. And uh, there, if you just, you know, you go to Spire and type title uh, uh, leptogenesis. Sorry, title baryogenesis. Then it goes on and on and on. I mean, there are many, many, many papers. So you can make interesting models. I think what is important to make progress is to have um, a link, uh, I mean, to embed that really into extensions of the standard model, and to have a link to other phenomena, like dark matter and inflation. So we will discuss a little bit about that later. So I'm now at the end of biogenesis, and before I start with inflation, maybe I uh, should just ask, are there some questions? Otherwise, we can have that later. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's um, sure it's related. Uh, but I think in this particular case of leptogenesis, I'm not really. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, I, um, I know there have been discussions on that, but I, don't, I must say I don't know what the latest status of that is. Clearly, in principle, uh, it's an important uh, topic in this connection because it's a bio number violating process. You mean here in Affleck Yeah. yeah. Yes, but why do people always say that you need supersymmetry? You just need a, a flat direction, right? Well, but I mean, the question is once you have a flat direction, how is it stable against quantum corrections? But, yeah, well, you will have supersymmetry. Well, uh, yeah, you can think, of, yeah, I think you, in principle you can shift off baryogenesis and models with, with shift symmetry. Yeah, that's true. So that's perfect. Yes. But I'm, right now, I'm not aware of uh, that, but probably it has been studied, I think. No, but it's true. I mean, you could just try with a shift symmetry. But the point is, once you do that, uh, you have to be careful, I think, because such a flat direction, if you have, say, a say modulus field like this, then the question is, uh, it's dangerous to take just one modulus field and an ad hoc potential for that. 
the question is how, how does it fit into a broader picture because otherwise there's a lot of freedom usually in constructing that and in the end uh, you get just one number which, which is a barrier asymmetry. Yeah. Anyway, maybe because there are so, so few experimental constraints this whole thing is really a nice playground for theorists also. You, know, you can try your uh, ideas and see whether you can produce uh, the right barrier asymmetry. Okay, so then maybe I stop here and now I come uh, to the second part, which is inflation. Of course, it will be uh, not that much time to discuss inflation, but I think I should discuss some aspects here because I think there's no other lecture on that and uh, also with some connections to, say, uh, biogenesis and a little bit dark matter. Now, uh, <clears throat> I said for baryogenesis, you have just one number. Here for inflation, at the moment, we essentially also have just one number, which is a scalar spectral index. I will come to that, which uh, this number comes from the latest data of Planck, which came out 2015, a few months ago. For the tensor to scalar ratio to which we will come, uh, we don't know what it is. Uh, uh, so far, there's an upper bound of about uh, 0.1. So where do these numbers come from? Again, as you know, uh, just one, two numbers, and probably even more papers on that than on maybe 10,000 more than on baryogenesis. Now, um, I've listed here, of course, not all the important historical papers, but some which will be important to us later. Starobinsky and his model, I think, is an important thing. The discussion of the horizon problem by Guth and then chaotic inflation uh, introduced by Linde is also a standard model, even if the simplest version even if it's probably not going to work, but uh, still it's interesting. Now, this um, you uh, have seen many times, I'm sure. Uh, I will show it twice also during this lecture, just as an advertisement, of course. Uh, these are the Planck data from 2013, 2015. I didn't even see such a plot in their paper, but there's no difference which can be seen. And because it's already such an enormous precision. And the point now is here, but of course here we see it looks like a big structure which we have, but uh, we should not forget that this structure is just the 10 to the minus, few times 10 to the minus six correction to something which is exactly flat. And so the first question in connection with, uh, bio, with uh, inflation is how can the uh, CMB be so isotropic? So I think this is an important point. So I will try to make a little effort and uh, try to explain the horizon problem. I guess some of you will be very familiar with that. Although, I must confess, I also taught it a couple of times in class, but from time to time, I still get confused thinking about it. So I think it's worthwhile to go carefully uh, through uh, this argument. And I should say, I follow a little bit, not completely discussion. I will give the reference later uh, in uh, some lecture notes, some report by Daniel Baumann. Actually, that's, uh, Daniel Baumann gave some Tazi lectures a couple of years ago, which he updated, so the version of 2012, I, you will have the reference on the slides, which discusses some things in a very clear way. Now, uh, so I will spend a few slides on that. Now, we know we have the expanding universe, as described by Subir Sarkar, and I think everybody knows this uh, robertson walker metric, for universe being either closed, flat, or open, depending on whether k here is zero, plus or minus one. Now it's convenient to uh, change coordinates like this. Instead of r, you use this chi, defined in this way. And instead of t, you use tau, the so-called conformal time. That, of course, you can do. And in these variables, uh, this uh, distance here, or the metric, now looks essentially as in Minkowski space. So that means if you just look at, uh, say, Minkowski space in polar coordinates, I mean, if you have, uh, you have here the time, you have here the radial distance now, the rescaled radial distance, 
And then you have the angular coordinates, usually a sine squared theta, d theta, d phi, uh, times a function which now depends on r here, on chi. And this is a function. We will essentially always use k equals 0 in the following. Now, uh, why this is important, let me say already, we will come back to that now a couple of times. It's, uh, it's important because if you use these variables, then um, light propagates, the light cone looks as in Minkowski space. Since uh, it's just rescaled, so that means light propagates at uh, 45 degrees. So if this is, say, chi axis, and this is the conformal time, then light goes like this, or like light goes like this. So this is the forward light cone. This is the backward light cone. This is very important. And that is particularly important if you want to discuss what causally connected regions are and where the horizon problem comes from. Now, an important notion is, as you know, I think Subesaka discussed it, particle horizon. So uh, particle horizon here, it's defined as, uh, in this way, say an integral from some initial time to a time t, uh, dt over a of t. So this is just, if you look at the metric, this is uh, just the uh, sort of the distance uh, light can travel in uh, such a, a time. And uh, now what one does is one defines a co-moving di distance by uh, dividing out the scale factor at that time. So I write this distance, a distance as uh, a scale factor times this co-moving distance. Otherwise, I would have to multiply. If I take the physical distance, here it's multiplied by A of t. So uh, this particle horizon, sometimes also called past horizon, which I like even more, has to be distinguished from the event horizon or the future horizon. That will not be important for us, uh, so I don't even mention it here. For us, only the uh, past horizon or the particle horizon will be important. That is defined like this. So this gives you the region uh, from which uh, information can have reached the observer until now. So that means if you, one should think in the expanding universe, as you learned, uh, say, as a balloon, which blows up, and uh, this radius of this balloon as a function of time is given by as a scale factor. And now one has uh, the distance between points is determined by two effects. One is the distance sort of on the manifold, and the other is uh, the distance on the manifold, say on a sphere, is independent of the, the physical size of this object, the size of the radius. But the physical distance in centimeters depends, of course, on the scale factor, and therefore on this radius of the sphere. And it's important, really important for the discussion to clearly distinguish these, these two things. And therefore, I think it's use, good to use these coordinates. Now, um, this, we have uh, the um, time evolution of this cosmic scale factor governed by the Friedman equations. Those you all know. Here I have used uh, the, introduced the Planck mass, which is which you also saw, I think, in Subesaka's talk, H, the Hubble parameters, the usual stuff, which you are all familiar with. And uh, then uh, what, you, what you know is that, uh, in fact, you can look at uh, how the energy density here scales with uh, the energy density scales with the scale factor. And that depends on the equation of state. So if you have uh, just non-relativistic dark matter, then the thing just space just uh, expands. So it's, the density is just volume suppressed. Omega is 0, and rho goes like a to the minus 3. If you have radiation, it's not just diluted. It is also redshifted. So you have a uh, to the minus 4. And if you have uh, vacuum, say cosmological constant, whatever that is, uh, you have here omega equals minus 1, and you have the miracle <coughs> that uh, the energy density, despite the fact that this thing expands, stays constant. Now, um, 
what is important is to introduce another quantity, uh, which is uh, the so-called co-moving Hubble radius. You know, the Hubble radius, uh, the Hubble parameter we know, and um, the inverse Hubble, Hubble uh, parameter today gives us the size uh, of the universe, which is about, say, 10 to, the tw 10 to the 28 centimeters. And it's good to also normalize that uh, to the scale factor. So to take 1 over h, which would be the Hubble size, and, or the Hubble radius, and divide it also by a. This is a so-called co-moving Hubble parameter, which is the analog of the co-moving horizon. And for that, you can easily, from these equations, uh, derive this. 1 over a times h is, is this the same quantity today times uh, a over a0 to 1 half 1 plus 3 omega. This is a simple thing, which you just get combining this. But it's a very useful equation. So that means if... Uh, if you, for instance, if A, uh, depending on what the equation of state is, say, for instance, take um, omega uh, equals zero, then, or omega equals uh, one third, then this co moving Hubble radius increases with A, whereas if you take minus one for this, it decreases with A. This is a crucial feature. So this is a so called co moving. Uh, Hubble radius. Now we can calculate the co-moving horizon by just using the formula. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, if I take the formula for the horizon and just replace it by this co-moving stuff, then I get that the co-moving horizon, is, the formula will come later again, is dA over A times 1 over AH. It's a strange way of writing these things, but it's useful. So you integrate from some initial value to this final value. And uh, the way, so here you see that that means the co-moving horizon is the integral over uh, the co-moving Hubble radius and integrate it sort of with a logarithmic measure, dA over A. Now, uh, you can easily do the integral and you get the following. This, uh, of course, the co-moving horizon, now if you look at it as a function of A, always increases. And uh, you have this prefactor, the co-moving Hubble radius today. And then you get uh, the stuff grows with uh, A. If you have meta-dominated as a square root, it grows linearly for radiation. And it is a constant and from which it decreases if it's vacuum dominated. Now, uh, for matter and radiation, as I just said, this thing always grows. Now make, say, what is sometimes called a natural assumption, or which one assumed, say, before inflation. You just assume that the co-moving horizon today is, if I go back to, uh, you know, it's uh, one says the age of the universe is 10 to the uh, it's 14 billion years, and if I go back to uh, the time of uh, recombination, that say 380,000 years, that should be most of the horizon. Okay, so uh, the total horizon now you say is bigger than the horizon at that particular time. That seems to be a natural assumption, and then one has a problem because uh, the equation of state, as you also learned from Subesaka, between today and recombination is about zero. So uh, from that you get then that this co-moving horizon today divided by the co-moving horizon at the time of recombination is given by this ratio of scale factors to the power one half. That by definition is essentially the redshift, which we know from, which is about a factor of a thousand. And uh, therefore, it means that if you take uh, the, say, the region of the manifold, which we see today, then it depends uh, at the time of 
um, recombination out of about uh, 10 to the 5 uh, causally di disconnected regions. And the question is, how can that be? Now, there is a very nice illustration of this puzzle, which you find in these lecture notes by Baumann, uh, which is the following. Here you have the conformal time, and here you have chi, this radius. And now, uh, and here you have what we do with the CMB. I mean, here's the observer, and the CMB gets uh, photons, observes photons, which comes from the sphere of last scattering. When uh, recombination, when the photons are decoupled. So he gets it from this direction, he gets it from this direction, he gets it from this direction, and so on. So this thing here, this radius, is sort of the size of the manifold, if you wish, uh, Oh, this circle uh, is a circle on the manifold of the uh, space manifold um, from where these photons start their propagation uh, to the observer. Now, uh, as we said, we assumed that uh, the horizon up to here is almost the full uh, particle horizon for the observer. But a little bit is left here, namely from uh, the CMB time, the time of recombination, to the Big Bang singularity. You know, if you just take radiation and matter as equation of state and you uh, solve uh, the Friedman equation, then you get a singularity. So that would be then here that you would define as time equal to zero. And here in this conformal time, this is uh, small compared to this. So that means. Uh, if you, from this point here, if you receive light, then uh, the back light cone of uh, this point is given by this. And you see it's completely disconnected from uh, the um, back light cone uh, of, of this point. It's here. So because this is completely disconnected, uh, causally connected, these two points can have never been in causal contact in the past. And so you may ask, uh, well, if this is the case, how it is then possible that nevertheless the temperature, which I see in these different directions, is the same at a level of 10 to the minus 6? This is the horizon problem. Now, with that, there are other puzzles of the same type, the flatness problem, and so on, but it's basically all the same. So this is the horizon problem, which is, I think, a real problem if you have just ordinary methane radiation. Now, um, what uh, inflation now proposes as a solution is the following. It says uh, during the phase where the universe was uh, dominated by Meta and radiation, I always had this uh, increasing co-moving Hubble radius, which is plotted here as a function of A on the logarithmic scale. So this is for radiation, this is for matter, this is maybe, again, the meta-dominated phase, and so on. Always increasing. Now what I have to do in order to solve this horizon problem, if, if I look at this integral, I and if I go to the size of the scale factor uh, at CMB, I simply have to make that bigger. If I make it big enough, then I can solve uh, this horizon problem. And that is simply done by smoothly uh, matching to this period where you have an increasing co-moving Hubble sphere, this one, where you have a shrinking co-moving Hubble sphere. If you can do that, then you can manipulate the integral in such a way that this horizon problem uh, goes away. I will show you again the plot. Now, how can you do that? 
Well, to get a shrinking Hubble sphere, of course, you need that the co-moving Hubble horizon decreases, which means that the second derivative has to be positive. If you now look at this Friedman equation, where the second derivative is proportional to minus rho plus 3p, you, mean, you see that this means that p is smaller than one-third rho. Now, this is impossible for ordinary matter and radiation. However, it is possible, for instance, for a cosmological constant, where p is minus rho. So that means if uh, before this um, radiation-dominated phase started, you had a vacuum-dominated phase, then you can have a period with a shrinking Hubble sphere, and during that you then easily check as a scale factor blows up from some initial value exponentially. But note that appears here the initial value of the scale factor. So that means you introduce a dependence somehow on the initial condition. Now, but if you do that, then you get this nice picture, again taken from Baumann's lecture. So we made it up to here, so far, where you have uh, the horizon problem. That means different points here at CMB have passed light cones which don't intersect. But if you now have this period before with a shrinking Hubble sphere, then you can just increase the causally connected region more and more and more and more and uh, until eventually you get the intersection and then you don't have any measured problem. This is what is done. So I think what uh, this uh, illustrates is uh, that really, uh, if you just take the CMB, which we know is so well established, we don't have to talk about anything else, if we have only matter and radiation, there simply is a big puzzle. One just cannot understand uh, the, uh, um, one just cannot understand the enormous isotropy of the CMB. However, uh, including a phase where the energy density was dominated uh, not by ordinary matter or radiation, but say by vacuum, you uh, get the possibility uh, to modify uh, the, uh, uh, dependence, of, I mean, to, to modify the structure of these uh, co-moving horizons in such a way that uh, this puzzle can be solved. Of course, you still have uh, the dependence on the initial value of this Hubble parameter. This, where was it? Uh, here, you have this. You see, it's instructive to look at this equation. Suppose you have an observer who uh, can start uh, somehow watch everything from the very beginning. Then he would start at uh, initial time at uh, where, say, so you start, say, from a sphere or something where the radius is a i. At that time, the co-moving horizon is zero, because if you put a i here, then this is zero. Then, as a increases, this moves to a constant. So that means as long as you are vacuum dominated, you approach a constant. This is sort of the constant, the fixed horizon, which you have in the sitter space. So that remains until you then have, say, phase transition, the decay, a reheating process after the inflationary phase, and you, are, you move to a phase which is radiation and matter dominated. In that case, then, uh, this core moving horizon is no longer constant, but starts to increase during radiation and during matter until it reaches, say, the value which we have today. But uh, what we don't know for instance, is how big is this value here, 
or how big is this value, the, the one today, relative to uh, this one, A0 over AI. So uh, that, that means we don't know how big uh, the causally connected part patch of, say, uh, the manifold, which describes Unifed, really is. It could be close to what we see now, the co-moving horizon. It could also be uh, much bigger. We don't know. That's related to the question of how many e-folds uh, of growth you have for the scale factor. And that's related to a question of initial conditions for um, inflation. So maybe that's a good point to stop.